Hi, we're going to get started. My name's Lindsay. Uh, it, I'm very, very pleased to see so many people in this room. Um, I'm an agile delivery consultant, and I'm currently uh, working with an agile delivery consultancy called Equal Experts. And we're working on a, a very large scale a government delivery um, in, in the UK, uh, where we have over 30 teams across multiple locations using a Scala microservices architecture. And those teams are delivering uh, releases into production several times a day. This session is going to be an experience report of the best practices and the pain that that team have felt, comparing that with an, another team I've worked with, which is a, a team that uh, are delivering a .NET monolith into production every week. So two teams, very different architectures, very different types of organizations, but both practicing continuously delivery very well. So before we get started, I just want to find out something about who we have in the room. So can you put your hand up if you're a developer, please? Great, okay, thanks. If you're a tester, thank you. If you're a web ops support deployment type person, wow, that man <laughs> deserves a lot of uh, thanks. Thank um, and any uh, product managers or scrum masters or project managers? Great, okay, thank you. So the second question, thing I'd like to learn about is how many people in the room deliver to the web? So put your hand up if you deliver to the web. Great, okay. And now a, a harder question. Uh, so let's have a show of hands. So put your hand up if your team has the capability to deliver into production at least once a year. So at least once a year delivering into production, okay? Great, keep your hand up. Now, so keep your hand up if you can deliver into production at least once a quarter. Okay, at least once a quarter, great. Keep your hand up if you can deliver into production at least once a month. At least once a week, keep your hand up. Okay, multiple times per day, Who's, who can do that? <laughs> great, okay, so we've got the right kind of audience in the, in the room, so I think you'll hopefully le all learn something about improving continuous delivery. So here's an overview of what we'll cover. So we're gonna look at two very different teams. One. Uh, is a, a team that, as I said, are using Scala. I've heard you don't have donuts in Lithuania, is that right? Do people know what donuts are? Yeah? You know what donuts are, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to use donuts as, a, as an analogy for uh, delivery uh, throughout this, this presentation. So there's a team that are using microservices delivering into production multiple times a day. We'll be comparing that with a, another team that has a .NET monolith, in this case a massive donut. They deliver that into production at least once a week. If we're looking at the, um, the pain of, of both teams and also the best practices, the thing that these companies ha have in common, as I said, is they both do continuous delivery extremely well. We'll start off by looking at the things that have helped them to go fast with their continu continuous delivery. So what are the accelerators that have allowed them to improve their delivery um, frequency? We'll also look at the pain that is both specific to both teams and also common to both teams. What are the things that we should be aware of when we're trying to apply continuous delivery? So some context. So I had a look on uh, Wikipedia uh, to just get a, a, a definition of continuous delivery that we can all hang off. And I've highlighted the, the bits that I see as being important. The fact that it's about getting value out to uh, the end users. It's about having short cycles. It's about having a process that is reliable and it's about being able to repeat that process at any time. When we apply it to donuts, we're talking about taking our raw ingredients, which in this case is our code, putting it through a production line, and getting it to the uh, end user, which case this happy chappy at the end, as fast as possible. The reason we want to do it as fast as possible is that the teams that are deploying and, and making those changes, they need to get feedback as quickly as possible they need to know as quickly as possible, have they broken something or have they added value? The reason we do really small uh, releases in continuous delivery, so releasing the smallest amount of a uh, change at one time, is because it reduces the risk. It's one of the key benefits and key reasons for doing continuous delivery, is that the size of the things you're deploying are tiny, and so you know you've changed very little, so there's less likely that something's gonna go wrong. Why am I comparing two teams? So I've had a look at, um, I've worked in quite a few different organizations and seen many different ways of deploying in production. And my conclusion is that there is no silver bullet when it comes to applying 
continuous delivery. You can find great recipes for making donuts, and you can follow those recipes, and you can make really good donuts, but the same doesn't apply to continuous delivery. There's no single path that everyone should follow, no set of single set of instructions for doing it well. One example of this is, is the organization called Etsy. So they have a massive monolith that's written in PHP. They still do 50 deploys to production a day, which is phenomenal given um, the size of their application and the fact that it's in PHP as well. They have a massive amount of traffic as well, so you know, they're dealing with a lot of production deploys despite having a heavy load. Compare them to uh, the world-famous Netflix. They have a microservice architecture, over 600 services, and they're, again, doing very high number of deploys to production every day, and they have a high amount of traffic. So two different, very different companies, very different architectures, but both doing continuous delivery well. Next, we want to have a look at continuous delivery in context. So it's important that when we're looking at how to um, apply continuous delivery to an organization to improve things, that we focus more on continuous improvement uh, than just on continuous delivery. There's a company about two hours uh, east of here called Target Process. It's a fantastic product. If you haven't used it, take a look at it. They uh, produce some very interesting blog posts about how their company has evolved over the last uh, three or four years. Um, so they are, have a dot .NET monolith, and in their recent post, the link is down there, they talked about how over the last three years, they've gone from doing 26 releases a year, down to 24, then back up to 34. So it's, I wouldn't call this continuous delivery yet, because it's still kind of uh, less or more than, they're not delivering every week into production. But the key thing I found from reading this article is that they're making all sorts of improvements across their delivery uh, or the dev development um, practices. Because they're not just focusing on continuous delivery, they're improving it in other areas like UX as well. And those improvements have made them a very successful company. So it's important that when you take stuff away from this and you apply it to your own organizations, that you keep in mind that the main aim is to continuously improve your whole development organization, not just focus on continuous delivery. So let's start off by looking at the, the teams in context. So the first team we're going to look at is the, uh, the .NET monolith. So they've been going for about 12 years. They're privately owned, uh, so that they're backed by a, a number of investment organizations. Because they've been going for about 12 years and they started off very small, uh, they have some, some spaghetti code that's at the, at the heart of their organization and also in the database. So you can imagine that that is quite a legacy. For the last four years, they've been using some, some uh, best practices in terms of how they develop .NET. So a lot of their, or most of their code now is, is very maintainable and easy to work with, but still it's, it's underpinned by some spaghetti code. Their um, application is a business-to-business -business application that receives a massive amount of traffic every day. It was one of the scariest things working in this organization that when we did a deploy, which we tend to do in the evening, we knew that the next morning when we came in, we'd be hit around 9 o'clock by over 100 million page visits uh, going through the application. So it was always a very nervous moment coming in and watching the traffic rise and rise and just hoping that we'd done a good deploy and there weren't any significant bugs. They've grown over the last two years. They're now up to about eight product teams. So they're all co-located. And their weekly deployment process looks something like this. So they have good continuous uh, integration, so they have a regular release candidates being built that have been through uh, all sorts of automated tests. They'll take one of those release candidates, run it through a manual regression test, which lasts about two days. Then they apply this concept called dog fooding. So dog fooding is where you take a product and you use it yourselves. So this organization, the product they made, was something they could actually use internally. Uh, the whole organization could make use of it. So they would dog food it, or as the uh, marketing people would like to call it, champagneing. So they would, they would drink their own champagne or eat their own dog food um, for two days just to make sure there aren't any bugs in it, and then they would release it into production. The second team we're going to look at is the, the Scala Microservices team. Uh, this is a, a model of the Asterix village. Are you all fans of Asterix? Yeah. So the reason I uh, picked the Asterix village is that they... Uh, have over 30 teams, uh, and each of those teams are working on a fairly separate um, service that's provided to the public. 
It's a, it's a very large government organization called HMRC Digital. Uh, so if you have anything to do with the UK and you end up having to pay taxes in the UK, you'll be paying taxes to HMRC. Now, because it's HMRC um, and people are paying taxes to it, that means we take about 70% of all government transactions. And over the course of a year, we'll have one billion transactions happen online. The part of HMRC that I've been dealing with and we're talking about here is what we call HMRC Digital. So this is something that's been essentially taking uh, the, the services that this government organization provide and writing them uh, as a greenfield project, so improving the way um, that they're provided. So it could be considered as greenfield. The I never thought tax would be an interesting thing. I don't know what taxes are like in Lithuania, but normally it's very, very boring dealing with taxes. Uh, so one of the interesting things about tax in the UK is you have certain spikes throughout the year. So the biggest spike that we have is at the end of January when a, a massive amount of people need to submit a tax return to the government. And we see in January an exponential rise in traffic uh, to a peak of about 4 million page requests on the, on the last day. Uh, so we're, we're starting to prepare for that now, doing lots of performance testing, making sure everything's uh, working fine just to cope with that uh, last day where it's a big hit. There's other peaks during the year as well when other deadlines happen. The size of HMRC Digital is, is, is massive. We're spread over three locations and we have over 30 product teams. That is something that was grown from one team just two or three years ago. As I said at the beginning, the, this, this, uh, this organization is doing multiple deployments into production every day. One of the successes of this team is that each of the 30 teams owns their own set of microservices. What I mean by that is, uh, to quote uh, Werner's Vogel from Amazon, is that we apply you build it, you run it uh, mentality. So the teams build their own microservices. WebOps provide the means to get those microservices through dev, QA, staging, production. But if something goes wrong, it's the team's responsibility to look into it, fix it, and get a, um, a fix deployed as quickly as possible. Okay, so now let's move on to looking at what the, um, the patterns are for successful practices. So what things do I see in both organizations that actually help them to go faster? So the first fundamental building block is uh, continuous integration. And it's really important that when you're looking at continuous integration in an organization, it's, you start with the mindset. You start with how people think about how they write their code, how they commit their code, and what the impact of those commits are on other people. It's very hard to get everyone thinking in the same way on this. Um, we've found the most effective way is to employ this guy and assimilate everyone that comes into your organization. That can be a bit tricky, though. There's certain um, health and safety implications of that. Um, what equal experts do when they uh, build a team that goes into a client site is they deliberately uh, find people that have worked uh, in Agile, using Agile best practices for at least five years. So they know that, that when they pull a team together, they have a set of like-minded people that are very skilled in doing this kind of um, work. The other aspect of, of continuous delivery is having uh, an infrastructure and a set of builds that um, work that are healthy. So you, you, it's, it's useless if you have a continuous integration infrastructure where your, your builds and your tests take hours to run, for instance. You're just not getting f uh, feedback fast enough. One organization I worked at, um, they had a very impressive continuous integration infrastructure, but they were plagued by uh, a set of builds that were hardly ever green. And so our, our build monitor, which uh, you can see up here, probably most of the year had some red components. And when you see red on a, on a build monitor and you see it there the whole time, people just start ignoring it. Uh, and it was something that, that really kind of hampered the team's uh, ability to go faster. So it's important that you look at your continuous uh, integration infrastructure and either get rid of things that are causing things to go red or focus some significant time to make sure that they, they get green. The second best practice uh, that I've seen in both organizations is making sure that you f focus on testing as an activity and not a phase. Most organizations, uh, or some organizations, they have this work stream. So the product owner will define what the teams need to build. Developer will build it. Then your, your tester will test it. And 
WebOps, unfortunately, will have to deploy it and cope with the aftermath. Uh, the two avatars are from the team I currently work with. Um, so the guy in the middle is a guy called Rocco, and the guy third along is a guy called Vinod. And that's the avatars they've chosen um, for our team. So this is a very, very common uh, pattern that you've seen in many, I've seen in many organizations. And the, the .NET monolith team, it was how they started when they were uh, deploying probably about once a year, maybe every six months. They had this kind of uh, handover. It's like a mini waterfall that you see here. This is not a good way of uh, delivering a product. A better way of doing it is where you, instead of thinking about testing being a, a phase that happens midway through, is you help the team to realize that testing is something that everyone does all the time. So when the product owner is defining um, the requirements and the user stories, it's important they're working with the team to think about how those things would be tested. How will they validate that what's been defined has actually been achieved in production? How will they measure that value? The same goes for the developer. When they're building it, it's important that they're working with both the product owner and the queue and probably web ops to, to making sure that they're writing tests at the right level. They're thinking about what their code is going to do in production and how they're going to validate it there. What kind of monitoring are they going to need to put in place? Taking this approach where everyone's thinking about testing uh, throughout means that the, the testers then can focus more on doing things like exploratory testing and providing a expertise to, to the other people in, in the pipeline. The third best practice is having a healthy automated set of tests. So this is the, the test pyramid that um, hopefully most of you are familiar with. So traditionally, it's, it's this kind of shape where you have unit tests at the bottom, API tests in the middle or integration tests, and then at the top you generally have UI tests or end-to-end -end tests. These are often written using something like Selenium. So this is the ideal that most organizations try and aim for. Now, in reality, you end up with some classic anti-patterns, such as the hourglass, which is a very nice shape in certain situations. Uh, but for your, for your tests, it's definitely not what you want to get. This is where people spend a lot of time running lots and lots of unit tests that ch test every method of every class. And then often the, the testers in the team or a dedicated automation tester will spend a lot of time writing end-to-end -end, uh, Selenium tests that test every pathway through um, to the front end. So the reason this is an anti-pattern is because it creates a very brittle uh, set of tests. The moment you change one aspect of a class at the bottom, it means you have to change lots of your tests. And that can be very expensive, and it can slow down the development process and put people off writing more tests, or put people off worse, refactoring the classes that are underneath them. It's also brittle at the top, because if you have lots and lots of end-to-end uh, -end user interface tests, then those tests are highly coupled to the, the user interface that they're testing. And so if you're making any changes to that user interface, it becomes hard to. There's a high cost to doing that. The second classic anti-pattern is the ice cream cone. Anyone recognize this? So this, again, is a, is a sign of, of organizations that uh, like the idea of, you know, of, of testing, of automated tests, uh, but either they're leaving it right to the very end or they're thinking that it is just the job of some guy that's going to be writing automated tests uh, on, on the user interface. So it's often seen where developers either don't understand unit testing or don't, aren't allowed to have the time to do it. So they write very few unit tests. They maybe write a few API or integration tests. Then most of the testing is done at the very end and focused on the front end. And as you can see, this is very unbalanced. This is going to topple over very easily. It also has the same problem of, of uh, fragility and that it's the user interface test is going to be very tied to the, um, the implementation. Both organizations that are, I've worked with that we're referring to here have um, iterated over time and moved to what we call a teardrop shape of tests. This is where we'll have uh, unit tests at the bottom. And the unit test won't be a, a large number that test every single um, class and every single method. They'll be focused instead more on behavior of looking at how does a, maybe a collection of classes or a set of classes work together to provide a business behavior. You'll always have unit tests that uh, focus on, on edge cases as well and, and trying to make sure that the different edge cases of a particular class are covered. But the majority of unit tests should be behavioral focused. You get most value from in the middle where you have um, a high number of tests uh, looking at either doing integration or ABI, API testing. So testing from the, the, the system boundary that's below the front-end interface or the front-end API. 
then you want a very, very small number of end-to-end -end tests. The tests that, that cover the complete system, normally a happy, happy day scenario. We also found that it, it is better if these tests are written either just by developers or a combination of developers and testers pairing. Having, in my experience at least, having testers um, do the UI tests at the, at the very top is a bit like a kind of waterfall process where developers will write their code, say it's ready to test, and then some poor test has to understand it and write some tests on top of that. So best practice number four. So this is about having a very low cost deployment process and, and an even lower cost um, rollback. What I mean by low cost deployment is not the, uh, the cost of putting the infrastructure and the process in place, it's the cost of actually doing a deployment. So imagine you have a paper clip that you need to send from one place to another, so one end of the room to another. It's going to be far easier and quicker for me just to fold up a paper airplane and throw it than to go and uh, order a beluga, which is this airplane, and put the paper clip on it and send it over. It's really important that it's there's as little manual involvement and manual cost as possible in your deployment process. A good example that we found of this is at um, HMRC Digital, where the, the infrastructure that we've built up means that teams can deploy automatically into dev and QA and staging. For, for WebOps to do the deployment into production, we raise a ticket in JIRA, and they can do it within 30 minutes. It's done just like that. That low manual cost means that people aren't afraid of, of, of releasing into production. It's something that we know we can just do without thinking about it or worrying about it. The next thing we'll look at is, is metrics and monitoring and uh, alerting. So if you're getting something into production, it's important to know that you've got something in that, that's not causing any pain, that's, that's providing value. So how do we do this? We need to be looking at... Uh, metrics and data from all parts of the stack. So we can look at uh, big data, so how are people using the application on a worldwide level? What, is, um, what trends are we seeing in the usage? We could be looking at social media, so wh what, are things, what are things that people are tweeting about or, and, and putting on Facebook about our application? This is something we found very useful at, at HMRC Digital, uh, where if people are having a problem with a government service, they're normally very vocal in complaining about it. Occasionally, you hear people saying nice things about how easy it was to use or how simple it was, but it's often the place where you hear a lot of moaning. And that can be a very uh, quick way of getting indication that you've made life harder, made life worse for people. You can also use things like Google Analytics to look at user behavior. So you know, what are the click-throughs? How long are people spending doing the process? Is it, are people taking longer following a release, or are they actually doing it quicker? It's important to be looking at business metrics, too. So. Um, how are you going to measure success when people go through a user journey in your application? And when you do a deploy, have you increased success? Have you made it easier for people to complete a user journey or made it harder? You also should be interested in things like response time. So how quickly does your, your service respond to a user request? How quickly do you get a response from a third-party API? It's important also to keep an, uh, a track on how many errors your service is, is, is generating. And finally, you'll want to be looking at, uh, are you running out of disk space? Are you getting high network uh, latency? Many organizations I work with, they look at the bottom two, and that's it. They don't look at the rest. And that, that's a kind of fatal mistake. There's a lot of data there, and there's a lot of uh, things to keep track of and to analyze. So the best tool we've found is um, this guy, the Eye of Sauron. can see everything, keep track of everything, and, and knows what's happening. Now, in reality, we don't have easy access to um, uh, this guy. So we have to come up with other things, uh, other ways of monitoring everything. This is the, the typical or the, kind of the, the best way to, uh, to monitor uh, things. So you want to detect when something has changed or, de or detect when there, there's a problem. You want to both alert on it as soon as possible, uh, display what's going on, and then allow people to respond and, and, and do some analysis of what's happened. The further right you get, the further more time has elapsed, and so the, the increasing amount of pain there is both for the people that use your application and for the people that are having to respond as well. What you often see in many organizations is, is this kind of uh, pattern where you're very good at detecting things go wrong, and when you detect something goes wrong, you put it on the screen, 
and, or you, you show it in some kind of uh, graph that people are having to watch. So the people that are looking at the screen thinking, oh, something's gone wrong, there's a red line or lots of numbers, and then they spend some time analyzing it and think, oh no, it's Joe over there or this team over there that we need to contact. So they go and contact that team. Lots of time has elapsed by then, so the team finally hear about it, they have to do their own analysis and finally they respond. And this causes a lot of stress for your, your, your end users and also for the team. So doing it this way requires a certain set of tools and I'll just take you through some of the tools that different teams have used. So for collecting all of your uh, metrics into one place, teams have used either Elasticsearch or PaperTrail. These are really great things for aggregating uh, lots of data. To send out alerts, uh, the current place I'm at, we use Sensu to trigger thresholds and pager duty um, to then send out the alerts to specific groups, either as an SMS or an email. There's a massive amount of tools for doing the analysis and display. And these are just a few of them, New Relic, Kibana, Grafana, Google Analytics. It takes a long time to become an expert in all these tools, but it's worth uh, putting in that investment. So a quick story of something that happened um, back at HMRC Digital. So we have uh, various metrics going into Elasticsearch, and one of those metrics is how many errors is a service generating. Those um, uh, metrics on, on service errors, they, if they reach a certain threshold, they'll trigger a sensor alert uh, that will then go off to pager duty and tell our web ops team that there's a service that's behaving badly. They have a lookup table that says, if this service is behaving badly, you need to tell this team straight away. So we've done a release. Uh, within about 20 minutes of the release, an alert was triggered. WebOps saw it. They contacted us because we had done the release to that service. We looked at Kibana straight away. And through seeing Kibana and looking at uh, the, the requests that were causing the alert, we were able to trace back to what the, the root cause was and, and get it fixed. Probably in an end to end from, from here to uh, the, the response was about 40 minutes. So I'm not going to read through this. This is just a summary of all the, the best practices I've covered um, so far. Okay, next we're going to move on to what are the pain points. Uh, do you have tough mudder in Lithuania? So the tough mudder in the, in the UK and in, in America is where people pay to run through a 10-kilometer assault course. And one of the things that's included in assault course is like a mud thing you have to crawl through, and you get electrocuted as you're going through it. People pay about 100 pounds to do this, by the way. Why it beats me, but it's, it's a lot of pain and allegedly a lot of fun as well. So the first pain that I've seen in both these organizations is trying to deploy without having users notice, so having zero downtime releases. It's a bit like your, your uh, web application is a person running on a treadmill. They're hooked up to all sorts of monitoring devices so you know that they're breathing correctly, their pulse rate's okay but you're trying to make changes to that person without them noticing, without any of your metrics changing. And that is extremely difficult. It's particularly difficult if you're making a change to something that um, is gonna be in several different states uh, across uh, a time period. So let's imagine you have a, you're making a change to a cookie. You're gonna change uh, a way that data is stored in a cookie. When typically when you make that kind of change, you're gonna have some requests that, that hit the cookie um, or uh, working with the cookie that are from the old version of the application that need to work in the old way. And you'll also have some requests working with the cookie using the new storage mechanism. So you need to design your, your deployment mechanism and design how you make the change so it supports both of those requests over a long period. The second pain point is manual deployment steps. I'm sure the WebOps person in the room will, will testify this is a major pain point for, for web ops people and people that are doing deployments where they have a release and they say, well, we just need to do this step, this step, this step, run this script, check this result. And it's like, well, what if something goes wrong? It's a bit like you, you don't want to custom make every single release. You just want to grab a release off the shelf, stick it on production. Web ops don't need, shouldn't need to think about this thing. All they need to know is who to contact, contact if something goes wrong. So those are the two kind of pain points that, that we've seen in, in the teams I've worked with. So let's now look at um, specific accelerators. So what things did I notice with the .NET Monolith team that helped them go faster? One of the great things that, that we did in this organization with, was FiveWise. So anytime we had a, an incident on, on production, so something that had a significant impact on our clients, we would get together everyone involved and ask why five times. 
And you do this because by the time you get to the bottom, you've generally got to the root cause. Now these are the steps. Some preparation is a good idea, so try and, before you gather people, create a timeline um, of, of what happened. It's important if you have something go wrong in production that you have someone noting down the time of, of what's going wrong and when so that you've got this data for later on. Try and get everyone that was involved, both from um, creating the release or putting the code in or doing the testing to people that noticed and then responded. Walking through the timeline is a good way of starting and setting the scene for everyone and then choosing where do you want to start, which, which is the best entry point for your Firewise investigation. Once you've choose, chosen your entry point, you would then go through something like this. So you'd look at what the event is, discuss why that event happened, and then consider is there anything we can improve that will either prevent this event happening in the next time or actually reduce this impact. Having done that, you'll then dig down a level. So, okay, so why did that event happen? Why did the why thing happen? And you'll see you go on and go on. And you, it's, very it's very easy to have lots of different um, branches that you want to go down. So effective way of doing this is actually to take a group and to split them into three different groups and get them to look at different aspects of the incident. This is a, uh, an accelerator that I think works very well for, for teams that have large monoliths. So the problem was that, that every week they were taking a, a release candidate um, from that had changes from about seven different teams and they were needing to do some regression testing on it. And that was uh, quite a painful process. So they had done lots of automated tests, but they still needed to put through a manual regression just to double check nothing was broken. And it's a bit like doing spot the difference. I don't know how many differences there are in these two pictures, but there's a few. And that's what the, the, the testers were having to do. They're having to think, so we have this thing on production, and we have this release candidate. What's changed? Where do we need to focus on? Where is the risk? That information is stored in two different places. Uh, your source control system tells you all of the source changes, uh, source code changes that have happened, and all the configuration changes that have happened between uh, production and the release candidate. And your, your project management tool will tell you all of the stories, defects, etc., that have been worked on. And we didn't have any easy way of, of combining the two. What you really want to do is be able to, to merge the two and then produce some kind of easy to see report. Um, and that's what we did. We, so we wrote an application that uh, used the APIs of both these systems to. First of all, go off to the source control system and say, tell me what's changed between production version and release candidate version. Then parse all of the commit comments for all those changes. In the commit comments, there'll be an ID that ties back to our project our agile project management tool. Then work out um, both which parts of the, of the application has that affected, so which areas like payments or APIs. Um, so you can group all your changes by area or you can group them by, by story or defect. And you can also then see um, what areas do you need to focus on and what actually were the details of the change. Why was that change made? This particular organization was committing onto, onto master, onto trunk. So their release would often contain changes that were feature toggled. And it's important to know, is there some work change in this, in this release that is, is feature toggled off so shouldn't have any impact on production? Let's now look at the Scala microservices team. So what things have they done that, that helped them go faster? So I think one of the, the big success stories is the fact that they, they applied this pattern from Amazon where teams own their own microservices. Teams uh, took responsibility for building it and making sure it works successfully in production. The web ops would provide the infrastructure, the, the route for getting to the different environments in production, but they wouldn't be doing the support of those microservices. The other um, success factor that's related to this is that we learned very early on that with microservices, you want to minimize shared library dependencies. If you're going to build some behavior that other microservices are going to use, you really want to try and build that and expose it as a microservice. The reason for doing this is if you find a bug in that behavior that is significant enough to affect all your other microservices, then it's much easier just to change a microservice and get that deployed, and instantly all your other dependencies will pick that up. It's much easier to do that than fix a library, get it distributed to all the teams, have all the teams plan their release, get their release done. Um, it, it's much easier going down the microservice route. So just the reason I had the, the picture of the asterisk fight is that, um, as I said earlier, the, the teams uh, were, were quite distinct. So we have like a, a fishmonger team and a, um, a team that does the, you know, selling meat and the ironmonger. So people that are building very distinct services that are used by different um, uh, members of the public, 
And that also meant it was, it was much easier to have fairly separate microservices that only had a few common dependencies. So some organizations where you perhaps have a more tightly coupled um, service might be a bit harder to, to apply this pattern. Uh, the other big accelerator for us was uh, having backward capital APIs. And this applying a more general principle, which is the principle of the surprise. So when you're um, you know, making changes to, to something that, that um, is being uh, continuously used in production and you're, you're wanting to have zero impact on, on the people that are using it, you need to uh, consider, if you're making a change, how does it impact the other teams um, that are using your, your uh, services first? And what we found was that when one team was uh, deploying to dev and they depended on another team's microservice, they were finding that the other team was making changes at the same time. So one team's microservice was breaking another team's and people were unhappy about that. People were very sad. And the solution that a lot of people thought would be great is why don't we have separate environments? Why doesn't each team have their own dev QA and staging environment where we can have like a golden um, version, so the version and production of a microservice. So we have a known quantity to test about, to test against. That sounds a great idea, right? And uh, no, it wasn't. Fortunately, our WebOps team um, kind of saw that the fallacy in this and they actually realized it was better that we all share the same environments all the way through to production. Because when we get to production, people are going to be changing versions multiple times a day anyway. By keeping the same environment shared across, uh, across all the teams, and it forced people to care more about the impact their changes were having on, on other teams, and to realize that any change they needed to make to a microservice had to be backward compatible. If they wanted to make a breaking change, then they had to start off with a backward compatible change and do lots of publicity, lots of cajoling to encourage people to migrate to the new version. So this is a quick summary of, of the things I've talked about for team-specific accelerators. Okay, we've only got six minutes left, so I'm going to go through a little bit quicker now. Oh, no, we're almost at the end. <laughs> That's quite good. And so in putting this together, this talk, of I've used a number of books, um, and these are worth looking at if you want to get more details on, on continuous delivery. So the first is a, a book that's on LeanPub uh, called Build Quality In. Uh, that's a, a set of experience reports from about 50 different organizations where people that have uh, applied continuous delivery in those organizations have written about the things they have learned. And if you go to LeanPub, you can use uh, that URL. Uh, it gives you that 20% discount off the book. So I highly recommend uh, that book if you want to learn more about it in practice. If you're looking at um, improving uh, your end-to-end -end delivery process, then implementing Lean Software Development by the Pop Index is also an excellent uh, book to have a look at. It also includes a great uh, chapter on value stream mapping, which is something we'll be looking at in the workshop this afternoon. Finally, the Bible of continuous delivery is continuous delivery. I don't really need to say any more about that. So who here has read this book? Who's read Release It? Okay, right. So if you're, if you're a developer in this room, and you're releasing to the web, you need to read this book. This is kind of one of my top three books on software development. It will blow your mind and make you care a lot more about what you're writing. It contains some excellent advice about how to uh, deploy, particularly to the web, in a way that is um, going to break uh, less things and is going to be providing a much more uh, fault-tolerant um, set of um, services. So. The next thing I want to promote is that there's going to be a workshop. Uh, we're going to start at quarter to two. It's actually a 90-minute workshop, so we'll be um, doing it in two halves. We'll be looking at how to apply value stream mapping uh, to, to learn about your, your delivery pipeline and improve it, improve its continuous um, delivery aspect. Uh, so we'll be doing it in two halves. The first half will be working, we'll be looking at the, the basics of value stream mapping, and you'll then be working in groups of three to map one of your delivery pipelines. So have a break, and then after the break, We'll then do some analysis so that he, your, your, your groups of three would analyze um, your, your, your pipeline and work out how to improve it. And then some of the groups will present back to the room. All right, thank you very much for listening. I know it's a very crowded room and some of your legs are probably very tired. Um, this is a bit about equal experts and a little bit about me as well. Any questions? How long does your deployment take? Currently, from the commit uh, up to the user see uh, it's working in production. So we, there's a good story about this. So we spotted a um, a bug in production. Uh, so one of the team noticed that um, I think there's a high number of errors suddenly appearing, 
and um, we realized we needed to fix this bug pretty quickly. So I think, I can't remember if it was the QA or the developer that noticed it, but they, they noticed it. They had a discussion with, with the QA and the developer. They figured out what change they needed to make. They made the change. They talked to WebOps to prepare them that we needed to do a, a, a very short notice deployment. Um, so I think end to end, it was probably about just over an hour and a half, maybe, maybe even just an hour. There was no involvement from the product owner. I tried to just to stand back and let them do it because the, the, I have a high amount of trust in the team and so does the product owner. When they see something's wrong, they know how to fix it. And our deployment process means we didn't sk cut any corners or, or skip anything. It was develop, deploy to all the environments, test and out to production. Any other questions? So, one more? <laughs> Okay. So if you deploy really often, does anyone have to look after, like when you start to deploy, do you have to watch if the deployment goes successfully or, like because I, 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 we also deploy a lot and we have this problem that it, if it takes time, so it actually takes your time to watch if everything goes fine. Okay, thank you. So the question was about, uh, do you have to watch deployment when it, when it happens and, and how does that take time? So we do uh, watch the deployment when it happens. So there's, there's two things that happen. The WebOps team, when they, they do the deployment, they'll be uh, looking at various metrics for probably about five to 10 minutes after the deployment just to make sure there's no spikes. The, the team will also have a QA person and a developer that will be uh, checking our, our metrics and key dashboards um, to make sure that there's nothing gone, gone significantly wrong. But it's, it's probably about maybe five or 10 minutes you know, after the deploy. So it's a small amount of time and it's worth it as well. More questions? So, one more. Yes, hi, uh, just one question. If you deploy very often, how do you notify the end customers and the customer support about those, the changes fast enough so that they could support the clients? Great question. Uh, so, so how do we notify our end customers and customer support? So th those are two very different um, audiences. So notifying customers, um, we, we try to do things so that customers don't notice. And if they notice, it's, it's like a good thing. So, that, so, we, so it's a like, bit like how, how Google would, would do it. We, we're trying to reveal things gradually to them. Um, so Generally, when we're um, releasing it, it's maybe adding behavior that uh, is going to benefit them, and so um, it's not making big changes very, very uh, frequently. They're subtle changes that, that people would hardly notice, um, so you don't have to kind of give them any advance warning. Uh, uh, the customer support thing is, is a bit harder to get right, and that's something that we're kind of still working on. So we, when, when we have our epics, where we're working with the customer support to give them advance notice of the epics, um, and they, an epic will typically span um, s several weeks, if not maybe a couple of months. So we, we give them that kind of warning about uh, that kind of change, but we don't tell them about user story level uh, changes. Okay. So our time went out. Uh, thank you for a good speech. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now we are going to have a lunch. Please, uh, everyone needs to have a coupon. The uh, lunch will be in the first floor. So, good lunch. <laughs>